So, on behalf of ISGAP, I'd like to introduce Professor Kadar and welcome him back to uh, ISGAP. He's spoken several times for ISGAP over the years, including when we were at Yale University. He gave two excellent talks there, and actually some of our colleagues, philanthropists and scholars who were at, at uh, the ISA, uh, ISGAP was funding the Yale project on anti-Semitism, they've said that Professor Kadar's lecture was among the best uh, ever that they've ever heard on the issue. Um, and before I introduce Professor Kadar, I also, I just want to thank Katie Joe, who's at the door, for putting this together and every event together here. <laughs> so she's the, uh, the organizer of the events. If you have questions and comments, please speak to her. And Ben Faharhi, who's standing here in the back who's in from the West Coast, Nevada, and California, who's on our executive committee of the Board of Trustees. He came in, we had a board meeting earlier today. So Ben is doing amazing work, allowing uh, these events and our work to take place. And uh, Ben is really a leader of our, our efforts, uh, what we're trying to do, in, in, in the real sense of the word. So Ben, thanks for coming. So Professor Mordechai Kadar, is a, a scholar of Arab literature, and he lectures at the uh, University of Barilan University. Uh, he received his PhD from Barilan. Professor Kadar is an expert on the Middle East, on the Arab population of Israel. He served for more than 25 years as the IDF in the IDF military intelligence, where he was a specialist in Islamic groups, Islamist groups and Islamic groups, the political discourse of Arab countries, the Arabic press and mass media and popular culture, and the, the, the Syrian uh, domestic uh, context. The Los Angeles Times, uh, Edmund Sanders described him as one of the few Arabic-speaking Israeli pundits seen on Arabic satellite uh, channels defending Israel. And he's been doing this regularly, and there's a, a YouTube that went viral a few years ago where he was uh, giving the business to Al Jazeera. And Professor Kadar, uh, it's really an honor that you're here, and he's been now on the road. He's, he's worse than Bob Dylan, I think. He's been <laughs> he's been on the road for for eight weeks, running around North America in blizzards and minus God knows what. He was in Canada and all over the North America, uh, trying to wake up, if I may speak on his behalf, trying to wake up the American Jewish community. Put it this way, and he's doing what. He's putting all of his energy and effort into trying to bring awareness and to wake people up at the issues at stake, not just in Israel, not just in the Middle East, but in Europe and in the United States of America. And I don't want to speak for him, but I know that he and many of us involved in these issues these days are really trying to wake up a community. And we need to wake up, and you need to tell your family, and you need to tell your friends and your colleagues that this is a moment in which all of these issues of global anti-Semitism, the rise of radical political Islam, and most importantly for us, the acquiescence and the silence of our community and of our political leaders, people who claim to be liberal, people who claim to care about democracy and human rights. We see the rise of this barbaric social movements throughout the Middle East and now on the streets of Europe, and the leader of the free world not the leader of Canada and the United Kingdom, not the conservative governments of Canada and the United Kingdom, or the socialists of France, or even the United Nations have spoken out. And here, I have to say that our leaders, uh, I, I'm going to be blunt, I'll tell you what I think, but I think our community leaders and the administration, when they speak about random acts of violence in Paris, when four Jewish people were killed just because they were shopping before Shabbat, when, when the killers, the Kubalis of, uh, of France were saying that they would never kill a woman in their jihad, but they executed a journalist who was a woman because she was Jewish at Charlie Hebdo. And our communities, our, our, our leaders of our communities and of, in Washington are calling this random acts of violence. But we will see that there's a reactionary social movement which is using anti-Semitism to try to influence and destroy democratic values, not just in the Middle East, but here too. So the next months when the, 
with the engagement of Iran and it's the, f the five countries plus one, the P5 plus one, are negotiating nuclear deals with Iran and engaging the Muslim Brotherhood, inviting them to the White House and to the State Department, and not mentioning anti-Semitism? Could you imagine negotiating apartheid and not mentioning segregation or racism? And the silence has an impact. We know in philosophy, when we do something, it has implications, it has an impact, and when we don't do anything, it also has equally powerful implications and effect. And we can no longer be silent. This is the month, these are the, the months coming ahead are crucial to the survival of the Jewish people and to democratic values. So on this note, it's a distinct honor to invite Professor Kadard to the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Small for inviting me and giving me the, this important pulpit. And Katie Jo, I don't see her. I also thank her for arranging um, this nice uh, evening. And I thank, of course, my friend Eva Rosenstein, who is here, who trains Israelis how to speak in the American media. I think that she, need, she deserves you guys, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just, uh, Professor Small, just to add a little bit for what you said about the kosher market. The prices of kosher food in Paris are between twice or thrice as uh, expensive as regular. Means somebody who goes to shop in such a place where almost all the products are significantly higher in price from anything which you can find in the street, he is definitely somebody who would eat only kosher food. Means a Jew. Okay? So now to say, knowing this, to say that it's a random shooting, it is really, really not in the spot. So, uh, uh, Charles, you can add to this. The prices are, for a reason, high. So who, who in the world would go to shop in such a place if he doesn't deliberately eat only kosher food? Means he's a Jew. Okay, so. Um, I, I chose this... Uh, this flyer, uh, because it came to me by, my, by mail, I got it by mail some years ago, 2012. And um, I just uh, wanted to show you what happens here in some universities. This is in Rutgers. A lady named uh, Charlotte Cates. Uh, Israel is an apartheid colonial settler state. I do not believe apartheid colonial settler state have a right to exist. What is this country? Isn't this a settler state? Are we all uh, indigenous Americans? And a lady named Kate, isn't she a settler or a daughter or a granddaughter or granddaughter, great granddaughter of a settler? So what do I mean? She doesn't believe that colonial states have the right to exist. So start with America before you talk, before you talk about Israel. Okay? But she doesn't think deeply enough. And at Rutgers, you cannot kill Jews, but you can help people who do. Support Palestinian homicide bombers. Okay? Hi, Rutgers. But Rutgers is not, is not our uh, issue today. We are today in something which is much deeper and much more dangerous than what happens in Rutgers. We are about uh, the anti-Jewish anti sentiment, and I don't say anti-Semitism when it comes to the Islamic world, because the Arabs, most of them are Muslims, are Semites. 
So they say, and this is correct, how can they be anti-Semites? They are Semites by themselves. So this is why uh, I titled my presentation uh, with anti-Jewish sentiment rather than anti-Semitism. But this is only a, a semantic difference. I mean the same thing. Uh, first of all, because anti-Semitism in the West is usually, or I think, I think solely, against Jews. It's anti-Jewish sentiment. And um, in the Islamic world, it's the same. So definitely, it is the, more or less the same thing. However, when we try to understand the nature of the anti-Jewish sentiment in Islamic societies, first of all, I must, at the beginning, to put on the table the fact that not every Muslim shares what I will speak today about. There are many Muslims who could live with Jews just like they, they, they live with Christians with no problem, with no enmity, with no, no issue and nothing. And even, I would say, most of the Muslims are those. Peaceful, nice, accepting, moderate as they are. I am not speaking about them because they are no problem, neither to Jews, nor to Christians, nor to any other group. So having said that, we are talking only about those who hate Jews. And even if they are a minority, still when we are talking about, let's say, 30% of a billion and a half Muslims, 30% is 500 million more or less. Okay? So we are talking about big group of people, even if they are a minority inside the Islamic world. Okay? So this is, uh, I, I didn't count how many are anti-Jewish in the Islamic world. It varies from place to place. But if I say that uh, something between quarter and uh, third uh, do carry some anti-Jewish sentiments, I think that I'm not mistaken. I'm not talking about the majority, I'm talking about the big or too big minority, which is hundreds of millions of people, uh, and they are spread almost all over the world, wherever there is Islamic community, some of them do carry these sentiments. And when we try to understand why they hate Jews, um, first of all we have to ask, or I have to ask, Ma, uh, Kathy Jo, how, how long do, oh, do I... No, no, you have uh, about 45 minutes left and then Q&A. 45 minutes left and Q&A. Very good. So first of all, we have to ask the question, where did, where did it begin? Where did it start? Uh, when the State of Israel was established? Or when the Zionist organization started to bring Jews to Eretz Israel in the late... Uh, uh, 19th century, when, 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 did it, when did it start? So if we trace the roots of anti-Jewish sentiments which are in Islam, we can find that they reach more or less the year of 610 CE, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, started to bring revelations to his tribesmen in Mecca, the Quraysh tribe, of which he was a member. He started bringing them stories about Adam and Eve, and about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and the, uh, and the angel Gabriel, and Allah, and uh, Joseph, uh, and how he was thrown uh, to Egypt, sold to Egypt by his brothers, and the issues which he had is with lady in Egypt, and the Israelites in, in Egypt, and Pharaoh, and Jesus, and, 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 and Johannes. So his family, his tribe, accused him that the whole thing which you bring, you bring as Islam, this is no more than Asatir al awalin In Arabic, as stated in the Quran, means the stories or the legends of the first ones, means Jews and Christians. They accused him that the whole thing about Islam, the whole Islam, 
is a replica of Judaism and Christianity because they are familiar with all these stories which he brings them about all these uh, uh, people and the events of the, uh, which are already described in the Torah, in this first uh, uh, testament, the second testament. So he actually was accused that the whole Islam which he brings is nothing new. It is only a copy and paste from Judaism and Christianity. This is, by the way, Muslims developed the idea that he was illiterate to say how could he copy from the Bible or the Second Testament if he is illiterate. Okay? I ask, how could he be illiterate if he was the business manager of his wife? Couldn't he read even a, a, settle, a, a note? So, okay, this is a question about his illiteracy, but never mind. Again, he doesn't have to read. He had a good friend, a Jew. His name was Kaab, who was in for the informant. And in order to hear stories, you don't have to read. You can hear, you can listen, memorize. So, uh, uh, apparently he was Kaab. He was the source of all these Jewish uh, um, stories, ideas, mitzvot, obligations, uh, um, or, or, or things which he brought from the Bible, from Judaism to, to Islam. Uh, so this accusation that the Islam is not an uh, original uh, religion, but uh, a copy of Judaism and Christianity, by the way, uh, brought him to, um, to embed into the Quran already messages against the Jews. Because in order to show that his religion is original, he has to show that Judaism is void. That Judaism doesn't exist anymore. And since Islam came to the world, Judaism doesn't exist anymore. This makes him a real religion, valid religion. How can you say that I am a copy of Judaism? Judaism is void. Is void. For example, there is a verse in the Quran which says, in Nadin and the, Islam. The, the religion at Allah is only Islam. Allah doesn't know any other religion. Allah doesn't recognize any other religion. So Islam is the only, the only religion in the entire world. This is, this is the idea. You know, you can compare it to the theory of replacement in the Islamic version. Once we had the Christian version, and later ca comes the, the Islamic version, which cancels Christianity as well. Okay? Now, since... Islam is the only valid religion. Jews should convert to Islam if they really believe in Allah. And if they don't, the wrath of Allah rests on them, as mentioned in the first chapter of the Quran, al mardub alayhim. Christians are those who went astray. Adalun, as it say in, in this, or Dalin, in, in this uh, verse. Uh, Jews are those whom Allah took the, uh, the gospel from because they forged and maimed and uh, uh, changed the Holy Scriptures, especially by erasing the name of Muhammad, who was already in the Torah and in the Nevi'im and Ketuvim, the prophets, and because Allah already gave them the idea that Muhammad will one, one day come, will come, and they erased everywhere when, when uh, Muhammad appears, they erased. How do they know? In one place they forgot. In the uh, Shira Shirim, song, song of Songs, there is a place which says, Kulo Mahmadim, that uh, the Kodesh Baruch is all sweeties or sweet uh, things. And in Hebrew, Mem, uh, mim, mem Het, Mem Dalet, means Muhammad is something sweet. So they didn't erase this time. It means that they forgot it or they didn't uh, notice that they didn't. F they so this is a proof that they erased all the other times. That this time, or this uh, appearance of Muhammad, okay, all these uh, 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 things which uh, nobody can really understand. But uh, uh, Jews are those who killed the prophets, many prophets, not only Jesus. Again, this is an idea which you heard from, from Kaab. And um, uh, Jews are actually uh, uh, descendants of apes and swines. 
monkeys and pigs already in the Quran. Okay, this, oh, there is another verse which says, and you will find, la tajidanna, means you will find that the worst enemies to the believers, means Muslims, are the Jews. Okay, so many, many verses about the Jews, and uh, it creates the impression, and I highly uh, uh, recommend to read the Quran, because if you read the Quran, even in English, you will feel that he actually was in some kind of polemic with Judaism, uh, especially uh, by those who accused him to take things from, the, from, from, from Judaism, to copy parts, of, parts of, of Judaism and embed them in the Quran. It's, it was insulting for him, but this was the reality, because if you actually read deeply the Quran, you can see that many, many ideas from the Bible, from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, are embedded in the Quran. Even uh, the, the slaughtering of, uh, almost slaughtering of Isaac, as mentioned in, in, the, in, 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 the, in, in the book of Genesis, was taken by Muslims, and today, or oh, since then, it is the slaughtering of Yishmael whom they claim that they are the descendant of, descendants of, okay. So, this is how, uh, this is why he was accused that the whole thing is no more than a replica of Judaism. So, already then, he started to bash the Jews, to call them names, denigrating names like s swines and apes, and so forth, in order to, to, to prove that Islam is not connected to them. How can he be connected to such people who are uh, 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 descendants of apes and swines? And it continued later when he emigrated in the year of 622, more or less 12 years after he be started his prophecy, when he emigrated to Medina. Uh, then he became the mayor, the ruler of the, of the city, but a group of uh, Jews did not convert to Islam. They refused. So um, after like a year and a half of attempts to, to uh, convert them to Islam, um, he slaughtered them all in one day. Um, and this is stated and uh, described uh, very proudly in, the, in, the, in his sirah, in his biography. Other types of Jews, Banu Nadir, uh, for example, were uh, slaughtered in an oasis near Medina, which they lived in. So definitely, when he became ruler, a commander of an army, which the, uh, in Medina, uh, he definitely treated Jews in such a way, uh, which uh, today many uh, echo, because th those who were, who were slaughtered out of the city were slaughtered in an oasis named Khaybar. This was the name of the oasis. Uh, to, until today, we hear slogans, Khaybar, Khaybar, Ya Yahud, Jaish Muhammad, Sayahud, means Khaybar, Khaybar, oh Jews, the army of Muhammad will come back. I myself, when I was a soldier in the 70s, uh, one day I was ordered to take a bucket of paint and to erase uh, such, a, uh, such a slogan which was written on one of the walls in uh, Jericho. Okay, so this, those events of the 7th century where he slaughtered Jews are alive until this very day. They take those precedents as the, the way how to treat Jews. Why? Because it, it's already uh, was done by Muhammad, who is the role model for all the Muslims, to wherever they are and in whatever time they are, they are living, you know, to, f to walk on his footsteps because he was directed by Allah and he was infallible and whatever he did should be the uh, example for every Muslim in the world wherever he lives and whenever he lives. So this is why history in this context is so important because people today base what they do on history more or less, like this Islamic State, which uh, already came in, all, all of a sudden came in, in uh, Syria and Iraq, who implement methods and, 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 and way how to defeat the, 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 the infidels 
from the seventh century, beheadings, burning the people, stoning them, women in the street, amputating hands of of uh, thieves, uh, selling uh, Yazidi girls to slavery. This this is how the seventh century was looked like uh, under the Islamic rule. So they today they implement the same thing. So it also when it comes to Jews, the same thing we we um, uh, uh, hear. By the way, this, the clip which uh, Professor Small talked about has thousands of comments by Arabs. I did not erase, I can erase because I put this clip on, on YouTube. I never erased even one, uh, one uh, uh, comment. Uh, I want everybody in the world to see uh, what people write, even if it's nasty things. Some of them are related to my mother. So, yes, this is the custom in the Middle East. So um, I, 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 I don't uh, erase anything. Uh, uh, some of them, in some of them, people call me a, a, a grandson of apes and swines. So it, it is part of the discourse. What appears in the Quran, it's part of, you see today, on walls and in uh, comments in, uh, in, uh, on YouTube. Okay? So, we cannot divide between ancient history of Islam and current days because they look at the books and they take from them whatever they want. So uh, uh, this is why the history of uh, Jew hatred in Islamic sources is so important because it is a fuel on the fire of today. Um, during the Islamic uh, uh, um, history, Jews were treated in various ways. In some places, Jews had uh, good positions, like in Spain, in Egypt. The Maimonides was a doctor, was a, uh, the, 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 the doctor of the Sultan of those days, where he lived in Cairo. In uh, Spain, in many places, usually uh, Jews were doctors of the, of the rulers, uh, may, most probably because they were good doctors. But this was not enough. They were chosen to be the doctors because they were reliable. They were not suspected to poison the ruler. As you know, as you know, those days in the Middle Ages, the doctor was also um, cooking the medications, preparing the medications. And it was very easy to poison because it wasn't something which you buy uh, with prescription in CVS or Duane Reed. So, uh, uh, it was easy to poison. So they, they were afraid that if they take a doctor from another family in their, uh, means the Muslims, he might work for somebody who wants to take, the, take the, the government or the regime. Jews never had any aspirations to become the rulers. So a Jew is reliable that he will not uh, uh, poison the, the ruler or the king. So this is uh, why, why they, so Jews were treated in some places, sometimes nicely, um, especially if they behaved according to the Sharia. Because the Sharia, as you know, is not restricted to only to Muslims as the Jewish halakha is. Sharia has much to say about Jews, Christians, infidels. This is, by, by the way, the, dif the big difference between the Jewish halakha, which is, which is applied only on Jews, while the Sharia, Islamic Sharia, has what to say about everything, in the environment also Jews, also Christians, the states and everything. This is why the, the problem with the Sharia, but this is not our subject. However, uh, Jews were also mistreated in some places. As you know, the family of Maimonides, uh, he, had, he, he was born in Spain. They ran away to Morocco, but they had to run away from Morocco as well because of a sect, Islamic sect named Wahidun, uh, who actually forced Islam on everybody who lived in that time in Morocco. So his family ran away to Egypt, to the east, uh, in order not to be forced to uh, embrace Islam. And those who did not uh, embrace Islam from Morocco had either to run away or to uh, have their heads uh, chopped. Uh, in other places, in Mashhad, for example, in the 19th century, uh, Jews were forced to adopt Islam. And actually in Tel Aviv, where I was, the, 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 the house near uh, the synagogue, which I was a part of, 
uh, th th there was another synagogue of Anusei Mashhad. Those Jews who came back to Judaism after they were forced to embrace Islam in the city of Mashhad today in Persia. Um, the Persians, the, the Persians, the Shiites, and this is stories which Jews t tell until today, uh, used to view Jews as impure, nejes in, in Arabic and Persian. And uh, whenever a Jewish lady went to buy fruits in the, in, the, in the store, she was not allowed to pick, because if she touches an apple in the box, the whole box becomes impure. So what she ha had to do is to stand with a basket, and the, and the, shop, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, shopkeeper would take the rotten uh, apples, the rotten thing, and throw into her basket without touching her basket, because the basket as well is impure. And she had to pay by putting the money on the table he, so they don't touch each other, each other because she's impure. So uh, Jews were, it's until this very day. Uh, <laughs> sometimes people call me nidges, means impure, because of this idea that Jews are impure. So uh, these things are existing out there. I'm not saying that everybody relates to us Jews as impure, but uh, definitely it is around. Nobody can deny it. Uh, when it came to more modern times, uh, we see uh, how uh, ideas which come from Europe uh, actually find a very fertile ground in the Islamic world. It started already in the 19th century, in uh, 1840, in a blood libel in Damascus, where six Jews were killed uh, because of... Um, a boy, a Christian boy, who disappeared, and they claimed that they took his blood in order to uh, uh, to to bake the matz matzot, the the bread for for Pesach, Passover, by uh, with using his blood. The same thing which we saw in Europe so many times, so many years. Definitely in, infiltrated into the Islamic world way before the Isl before the Zionist uh, movement came to the world. Because the first Zionist movement, uh, the first conference of the Zionist movement was in 1897. This was dozens of years uh, beforehand. So you cannot uh, uh, blame the Zionist movement for this blood, blood libel of Damascus. This is something which was totally detached from whatever happens in, in the land of Israel. It came from Europe. Um, uh, the anti-Jewish sentiment increased uh, when the Zionist organization started, or not only, or even before, Jews started to come to the land of Israel um, uh, in big numbers uh, ever since the, the end of 19th century, and um, uh, Jewish uh, towns and farms were started to be built in the land of Israel, starting in Petah Tikva in 1882, and Rishon uh, Etzion, Rehovot, Rosh Pina, and many others. Um, they, those days, they didn't see yet the state of Israel, but they were already against the immigration of Jews, or coming of Jews to Eretz, to land of Israel, because some of them understood that the Jews are planning something, and they, of course, they read the Jewish uh, uh, newspapers, especially in English, which were in published in Britain. So the intentions of the Zionist organization, since it was established, to bring Jews to Israel and finally to have a Jewish home, and everybody has to understand what Jewish home is, especially since 1917, since the declaration of Balfour, uh, they understood that here the Jews are planning something big to do in the land of Israel, means to come back to their land, come back to life, come back to be Allah forbid a religion, a, 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 a relevant religion. And this is the problem. Because Judaism, as I said before, can, was cancelled by Islam. Islam came to the world to replace Judaism and Christianity. This is the basic idea of Islam. The whole raison d'etre of Islam. And here Jews are coming back to their land. Later, in 1948, they established a state which um, the world recognized. Okay, but since when do they have any right to have a state? They have to be subjugated to Islam, to be Ahal Zimma, to be Zimis. 
uh, you can read the book of Bat Yor, Zimis and Zimitude. She, she explains uh, very eloquently how, w- what it means. Um, they should live under the Islamic rule with the terms of, the, of Islam, which gives them whatever he gives them. He, they have no right to be sovereign on any land. Uh, this was all in 1948. 67, they dared to occupy Jerusalem, which is a third place in holiness to the Sunni Islam, Sunni Islam, not the Shi'i Islam. And what will be the next step? They will build the temple. And this way, this is what they are afraid of. This way, Judaism will come back to life. So what will be the Islam? The whole raison d'etre of Islam is cancelled if Jews come back to life. So for them, viewing Israel and the Jews support Israel, and the Jewish claim to, le- to, the, le- to the land of Israel and to the right of Jews to live in, in, in the land of Israel, this is something which they view as a theologic threat on Islam. Before it is anything connected to territory, because it is an, anything connected to national rights or political rights or human rights or whatever rights, it is, first of all, it is a theologic threat on Islam because they have no explanation How come Jews coming back are coming back to their land, to their city, and Allah forbid they will build the third temple. By the way, this is why they are so harshly, vociferously, are against Jews who pray on the Temple Mount. <coughs> Somebody told me, I, I didn't see it, that in Turkey there are demonstrations where people are carrying signs um, Al-Aqsa, dot, dot, Jews are denigrating Islam. So by, by praying in Al-Aqsa, Jews denigrate Islam. Excuse me? We pray in a place which once was the place of our temple. We have nothing to do with Islam. We don't mean any, to say anything or to do anything to Islam. We have nothing against Islam. Let them believe what they, what they believe in Mecca or Medina. We have, what, the problem is that when we exercise our right to pray in the Temple Mount, it is viewed by them as a threat on Islam. So this is why they are so united against any Jewish manifestation of um, control over uh, Jerusalem in general, Temple Mount in particular, to a degree that even if Israel wants to build a, a, a bridge which leads to the Temple Mount from the outside, they are against it. Why? Because it shows the Israeli mastership over the Temple Mount. And this is something which is contradicting the most basic belief on Islam, of Islam, which came to the world to replace Judaism, to cancel Judaism. And this, these deeds are actually Uh, 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 invoke their most profound religious hatred against Jews as motivated uh, uh, Muhammad in his days. Uh, when it comes to Europe, it's also uh, uh, reach a degree that they actually um, copy European uh, uh, methods of how to treat uh, uh, Jews and Judaism. I'll show you some some uh, uh, examples of uh, what they publish. First of all, um, you might know there is a new library in Alexandria in Egypt named the Library of Alexandria. Mubarak already built it with the money of the world, the UNESCO, but uh, he actually take a name of something else. The Library of, of Alexandria was a, v- a giant library which was already built in the third century before Christ by Ptolemaeus, the son of uh, Alexander the Macedonian, who actually built Alexandria on the name of his father. 
He built the library of Alexandria already then, and he collected into this library uh, all or most of the, the scriptures which he could find, mostly pap papyri, uh, of the ancient world, from Greek mythology and many other from Egypt, and it was a, a, a whole a treasure of the ancient uh, knowledge, ancient writings, ancient stories and whatever, this giant library of Alexandria, well known in the uh, history of the ancient world. Uh, when, Egypt, when Egypt was occupied in the 7th century by the Muslims, the, um, the commander of the Muslims, Amr, Amr ibn al-As, and this is uh, described in Islamic history, history books, he stood in front of the Alexandria uh, uh, library and he said if everything in this library is correct it, is a, it appears older in the Quran which collects all the wisdom of humankind so we don't need the, the, the library if it is not correct we don't need it ok if it is correct it's in the Quran so we don't need it if it is not correct we really don't need it so he burned the whole, the whole place. <coughs> Today they try to say that it was not really, didn't really happen. Um, Mubarak built again the library of Alexandria on the, the same name. And he dedicated the room uh, to every culture in the world. Tried to. Uh, one, one, one room is of course of the, was dedicated to Judaism. And in every room there are uh, bookshelves of this culture and in the display one or two books which are the most important of this culture. The Israeli ambassador of Egypt was invited to cut the ribbon of that room uh, when the library was established and he went into the room to see what books they have in display and they saw in the display, in this special uh, cabinet of display, that a sign which says the two most important books of Judaism. One was the Bible, and the other one was the protocols of the elders of Zion. He immediately protested against it. What do you mean? This is a forgery from Eastern, Eastern Europe. What do you mean? This is an important book for, for Judaism. This is a sheer lie against Judaism. It took them three months until they replaced it, until they took it out. Uh, you can uh, attribute it to the Egyptian uh, slowliness in some kinds, some things, but you can definitely say that it was because of they did not want to replace it, and he had to send like every week another letter. Hey guys, the book is still there. Please remove it. If you want, I can give you another book or another idea. This book is shouldn't be there in that room is, uh, at all. But this this uh, incident actually. Uh, shows us to what extent, and I give them the benefit of the, of the doubt that did not mean they did not mean to bash Jews by this book. They thought, I let's give them the benefit of the to benefit of the doubt that they actually thought that this book is serious, real, and it is important for Jews because they knew about this book. It, this shows how deeply this book appears in their uh, knowledge about du Judaism uh, to a degree that there are so many editions of the protocols in Arabic only, before Turkish, before Persian, before Urdu, before other Islamic languages. I collected some uh, uh, covers, some covers of books which were uh, uh, published, uh, either the protocols themselves or uh, po protocols um, um, abbreviated or annotated. Or, or, first of all, they took it from the West, La, Las Protocolos de los Sabios de Sion, okay? And here, Jews are connected with the money, with the church, with the Nazism, of course, with the communism, and the free Masons. Okay? Jews are the hand all these are operated by the Jews. Okay, these are the protocols. Uh, this is the international Jew. You heard about uh, Henry Ford? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
a Jew lover. <laughs> Henry Ford Sr., international Jew. They, this was more or less the, we'll, we'll get back to this. This, these are the uh, uh, covers of the protocols, different covers. Just look at the, at the graphics which accompany the words. By the way, this name, this, the title of this book is The Kingdom of the Satan, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The protocols of this are the subtitle. The, the, real, the big title, or super title, is uh, The Kingdom of, Sa of the Satan. <clears throat> this is something also which accompanies one book. Of course, they are taking the ideas uh, from Europe of the Jewish spider which have everything in his net. I wish. <laughs> I wish it was like that. Uh, <coughs> the revelation and its opposition. This is from Egypt. Okay, just look at the at the uh, uh, images which are put on these books and every one of these images is actually a cover, a front cover of one of the versions of the protocols of the Elder Zion. Charles, I can give you the whole thing. Again, the spider. The blood. The snake, uh, the supertitle is The Jewish Danger Above the Protocols. Again, the snake, the blood. This is an internet version. The whole world will be burning because of what happens and the Magen David, David Starr, is above the world. This is from this book. This is the first, I think, this is the first edition in Arabic of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It was written by Mah uh, Abbas Mahmoud al-Akkad, one of the Egyptian thinkers of the 19th century, already then. What year was this book? What year? Uh, I think either at the end of the 19th century or beginning, uh, beginning of the 20th. When, when the protocols were written? I think the late 1890s. Okay, this is, the, this is in, uh, according to what I think, he, he lived in the change of the, of the centuries, between the 19th of the century uh, and, the, and the 20th. So this, I think, is the first edition already the uh, uh, images which which saw later in the Der Sturm. Look at the eyes with the Star of David. This is the same from the beginning. Sharon. And there are many, look at this nice, George W. Bush, Sharon, Fuad Ben Eliezer, Barak, this I don't, uh, don't and the others here also. Einstein. This book is particularly, uh, particularly uh, uh, interesting. This was written by a guy named Abdel Wahab al Masiri. He was, um, I think, an apostate, a Muslim, of course. He was born Muslim. He was a scholar in Egypt. Uh, he passed away three or four years ago. And he was one of the biggest oppositionists for, for uh, Mubarak. Uh, but he wrote, he, I think he spoke Hebrew because uh, I had with him like at least three times uh, encounter in, on TV. We took part together in debates. And whenever he was saying an Israeli name of a man, he said it in Hebrew means with a good pronunciation, with P or P, 
not with B, as, the, as most of them say, and with uh, Tseren, so go with the E, not the I. So definitely, when he uh, 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 talked about Israelis, he pronounced their names, even foreign names, like Rabinovich or things like this. He pronounced them uh, very well, so I assume that he read uh, Hebrew. He wrote a very big encyclopedia on Judaism and Zionism, and this book, I, I believe, is an offshoot of his this encyclopedia because this, this the, the, the title is Al Protocolat, means the protocols and the Judaism and, Z and Zionism. So I believe that this book has much to do with his encyclopedia of Judaism and Zionism as appears in, uh, in the title of this uh, book. Um, and he was a very big Jew hater. And he was a communist. <coughs> so here you can see. OK, so there are many like this. But I want to return. I want to return to another one, which I showed in the beginning. Because here is the most uh, uh, interesting. Well, not this. This. This is another book uh, which is published, was published uh, recently after Sisi kicked out Mursi, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, president, from his uh, office. It was in mid-2013. Uh, this book appeared later. This book is, says, Cyril Il Raya, means top secret, Protocolat Chachamat El Ikhwan, means the protocols of the rabbis of the Muslim Brotherhood. Chacham <laughs> 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 in, in Arabic is Rav, Rabbi. So he, do, he doesn't take the elders, he says rabbis, means the Muslim Brotherhood, which the Sisi government want to bash, he, they are rabbis, not elders. Okay? So he uses, they use this, uh, this term deliberately, and they know how to choose the words. And, of course, the Ikhwan. And this is already the second uh, uh, edition. Now, what you see here is the Magen David, is the uh, Star of David, and pictures of this Khaled Mash'al. This Khaled Mash'al. With, with the Star of David. Okay, Hamas. Okay? And all the others are the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Akif and others. Okay? So the protocols are so deeply engraved into the mindset of people in the Arab world to a degree that they use the same idea in order to bash each other. Now Sisi is doing it to the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, so this is only a, an anecdote uh, which shows you uh, the, the influence of their idea of these protocols, how it is part of the thinking in the Arab world. Uh, I think I'll sum in this point. Uh, we see definitely the Islamic sentiment against uh, Judaism as something which Muhammad already in his time in the seventh century uh, had to employ in order to establish his uh, religion as a, a re relevant religion and not a copy or replica of Judaism and Christianity. Bashing Jews was necessary in order to prove the Jews are wrong by not uh, uh, converting to Islam. Uh, in some parts of history, Jews were treated nicely, but in others, not. Uh, the recent establishing of the Zionist organization and the State of Israel adds oil on this uh, hatred and uh, uh, why when they meet with the uh, Western anti-Semitism, they have no problem to take elements, books, ideas, graphic uh, um, uh, issues in order to employ and to embed into their uh, their message. We saw it uh, in the 30s when uh, Arabs, nationalists, uh, were 
showing Jews as cockroaches and uh, images which actually were copied from Der Stürmer. Uh, not only this, even the Mein Kampf was translated to Arabic, not, not translated, was Arabized by some people in Iraq. Marabized means whenever it, it says Aryan, they said Arabs. And they actually adopted the ideas of Mein Kampf to relate to Jews, to Christians, and to others who do not fit their mind or the, their idea of how the Iraqi nation should, uh, should look like. So definitely we, we also saw infiltration of Nazi ideas into the, the Islamic world and implemented uh, on Jews, on against Jews, as we saw the massacre against the Jews of, of, uh, of uh, Baghdad uh, in 1941, the uh, Farhud, where uh, almost 200 Jews were slaughtered. Um, of course, the fact that we, Israel defends itself, uh, and which means that sometimes Jews have to kill Arabs or Muslims. This is something which is totally, totally unacceptable by Islam, because Jews have not, no right to kill Muslims. It, again, adds to the hatred and to the sentiments which are uh, fueled by the ideas of Islam, of supremacism of Islam, and the fact that Islam came to the world to cancel Judaism and to replace it along with Christianity. This is, in very short, a, a little survey, historic and not only, historic of how Muslims, and again, not all the Muslims, but enough Muslims think about Jews, feel about Jews, and act against Jews, especially today in Europe, when we see today the meet, real meeting of Islam, which emigrates to, to Europe and meets there the local anti-Semitism, and we see them together uh, with bound hands against the Jews who are identified as part of the regime, part of the system, and you know what has to do to the system, so this is why Jews are the victims, at least partially. I think I'll open the floor for uh, comments, questions, I'll try to answer. Sir. We see the rise of this barbaric social movements throughout the Middle East and now on the streets of Europe. And the leader of the free world, not the leader of Canada and the United Kingdom, not the conservative governments of Canada and the United Kingdom, or the socialists of France, or even the United Nations, have spoken out. And here, I have to say that our leaders, uh, I, I'm going to be blunt, I'll tell you what I think, but I think our community leaders, and the administration, when they speak about random acts of violence in Paris, when four Jewish people were killed just because they were shopping before Shabbat, when, when the killers, the Kubalis of, uh, of France, were saying that they would never kill a woman in their jihad, but they executed a journalist who was a woman because she was Jewish at Charlie Hebdo. And our communities, our, our, our leaders of our communities and of, in Washington are calling this random acts of violence. But we will see that there's a reactionary social movement which is using anti-Semitism to try to influence and destroy democratic values, not just in the Middle East, but here too. So th the next months, when uh, with the engagement of Iran, and it's the, f the five countries plus one, the P5 plus one, are negotiating nuclear deals with Iran and engaging the Muslim Brotherhood, inviting them to the White House and to the State Department, and not mentioning anti-Semitism? Could you imagine negotiating apartheid and not mentioning segregation or racism? And the silence has an impact. We know in philosophy, when we do something, it has implications, it has an impact, and when we don't do anything, it also has equally powerful implications and effect. And we can no longer be silent. This is the month, these are the, the months coming ahead are crucial to the survival of the Jewish people and to democratic values. So on this note, it's a distinct honor to invite Professor Kadard to the podium.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Small, for inviting me and giving me the, this important pulpit. And Katie Jo, I don't see her. I also thank her for arranging um, this nice uh, evening. And I thank, of course, my friend Eva Rosenstein, who is here, who trains Israelis how to speak in the American media. I think that she, need, she deserves And you guys, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just, uh, Professor Small, just to add a little bit for what you said about the kosher market. The prices of kosher food in Paris are between twice or thrice as uh, expensive as regular. Means somebody who goes to shop in such a place where almost all the products are significantly higher in price from anything which you can find in the street, he is definitely somebody who would eat only kosher food. Means a Jew. Okay? So now to say, knowing this, to say that it's a random shooting, it is really, really, So on behalf of ISGAP, I'd like to introduce Professor Kadar and welcome him back to uh, ISGAP. He's spoken several times for ISGAP over the years, including when we were at Yale University. He gave two excellent talks there, and actually some of our colleagues, philanthropists and scholars who were at, at uh, the ISA, uh, ISGAP was funding the Yale project on anti-Semitism. They've said that Professor Kadar's lecture was among the best uh, ever that they've ever heard on the issue. Um, and before I introduce Professor Kadar, I also, I just want to thank Katie Jo, who's at the door, for putting this together and every event together here. <laughs> so she's the, uh, the organizer of the events. If you have questions and comments, please speak to her. And Ben Fahari, who's standing here in the back who's in from the West Coast, Nevada, and California, who's on our executive committee of the Board of Trustees. He came in, we had a board meeting earlier today. So Ben is doing amazing work, allowing uh, these events and our work to take place. And uh, Ben is really a leader of our, our efforts, uh, what we're trying to do, in the, in, in the real sense of the word. So Ben, thanks for coming. So Professor Mordechai Kadar, is a, a scholar of Arab literature, and he lectures at the uh, University, Bar Ilan University. Uh, he received his PhD from Bar Ilan. Professor Kadar is an expert on the Middle East, on the Arab population of Israel. He served for more than 25. Not in the spot. So, uh, uh, Charles, you can add to this. The prices are, for a reason, high. So who? Who in the world would go to shop in such a place if he doesn't deliberately eat only kosher food? Means he's a Jew. Okay, so um, I, I chose this uh, this flyer uh, because it came to me by my, by mail. I got it by mail some years ago, 2012, and. Um, I just uh, wanted to show you what happens here in some universities. This is in Rutgers. A lady named uh, Charlotte Cates. Uh, Israel is an apartheid colonial settler state. I do not believe apartheid colonial settler state have a right to exist. What is this country? Isn't this a settler state? Are we all uh, indigenous Americans? And a lady named Kate, isn't she a settler or a daughter or a granddaughter or granddaughter, great granddaughter of a settler? So what do I mean? She doesn't believe 
that colonial states have the right to exist. So start with America before you talk, before you talk about Israel. Okay? But she doesn't think deeply enough. And at Rutgers, you cannot kill Jews, but you can help people who do. Support Palestinian homicide bombers. Okay? Hi, Rutgers. But Rutgers is not, uh, is not our... Uh, Five years as the IDF in the IDF military intelligence, where he was a specialist in Islamic groups, Islamist groups and Islamic groups, the political discourse of Arab countries, the Arabic press and mass media and popular culture, and the, the, the Syrian uh, domestic uh, context. The Los Angeles Times, uh, Edmund Sanders described him as one of the few Arabic-speaking Israeli pundits seen on Arabic satellite uh, channels defending Israel. And he's been doing this regularly, and there's a, a YouTube that went viral a few years ago where he was uh, giving the business to Al Jazeera. And Professor Kadar, uh, it's really an honor that you're here. And he's been now on the road. He's, he's worse than Bob Dylan, I think. He's been, <laughs> he's been on the road for, for eight weeks, running around North America, in blizzards and minus God knows what, he was in Canada and all over the North America, uh, trying to wake up, if I may speak on his behalf, trying to wake up the American Jewish community, put it this way. And he's doing what, he's putting all of his energy and effort into trying to bring awareness and to wake people up at the issues at stake, not just in Israel, not just in the Middle East, but in Europe and in the United States of America, and I don't want to speak for him, but I know that he and many of us involved in these issues these days are really trying to wake up a community. And we need to wake up, and you need to tell your family, and you need to tell your friends and your colleagues that this is a moment in which all of these issues of global anti-Semitism, the rise of radical political Islam, and most importantly for us, the acquiescence and the silence of our community and of our political leaders, people who claim to be liberal, people who claim to care about democracy and human rights.